We also have 51,000 nails in the health professionals follow-up study. We have children. We have about 26,000 children in the Growing Up Today study. These are children and nurses' health study, two participants. So lots and lots of cohorts where we've, we've got really rich health information prospectively followed up over decades, right? Um, and so what we do is we take those addresses, those latitudes and longitudes, and we layer on other spatial data to create exposure metrics, right? So, uh, you know, and again, you guys are computer scientists, so you probably understand, like, these are, uh, this is a an air pollution model. It's uh, predicted air pollution at a very fine resolution at the residential address level. Um, this is particular matter, PM 2.5, which is fine particular matter, right? Maybe some people have heard about this this week, head nodding. Uh, but we can predict this daily, right? So a daily air pollution model that takes into account, you know, monitoring stations, but also spatial data. Um, so you create these models to predict and, you know, basically compute where you don't have a monitor, right? So really, really big data there. And we overlay that with our residential addresses. We also have data on uh, vegetation. So uh, greenness or the normalized difference of vegetation index, the satellite data from uh, well, MODIS, but but um, also Landsat, right? So 30 minute, 30 meter resolution data about every 16 days for every surface of the globe. Um, we actually try to make it a little bit easier. We only take every three months instead of every 16 days just to, to reduce the data a little bit, but it's still terabytes of, of data uh, dating back to the 1980s, right? So we have lots and lots of satellite data on vegetation. Um, we have satellite data also on light at night. So these are annual measures. That's a little bit easier to deal with. Uh, and they're one kilometer resolution, so they're not that big. But we link that to our addresses. Um, and then we also have noise data. So we have the model noise data set. Um, and this is, you know, a set of a few covariates. We have others that I'm not going to talk about here. Walkability metrics, you name it. We have lots and lots of spatial data that we link to our participants, right? Um, but I want to talk a little bit about nature and green space. So this is uh, actually, I think this is MODIS data. But you can see the, the temporal variability, right? But over a year, this is just showing you the variability in vegetation across the US. So we have this really rich data on nature. Um, but I always like to talk about nature by starting with like a, what I call the face of the slide, right? This is uh, just viewing Yosemite, you know, may stir something inside of you, right? There may be a reason that nature is good for us. Um, and there's a lot of theory on this. There's uh, biophilia, this idea that we've evolved with nature to have an affinity for nature. We are part of nature. So this is our, you know, the setting that we should be in, not in a, you know, classroom staring at a computer screen, right? Um, and I think, you know, it doesn't have to just be Yosemite. Uh, it could be, you know, the Esplanade. It could be anywhere. It could be a house plant in your home, right? That might give us this kind of health benefit. Um, and there's, uh, you know, I'll talk about why we think this is, uh, you know, there's uh, another theory, attention restoration theory, that there's something, you know, like we're staring at computer screens all day, and there's something about watching, you know, trees sway in the wind that allows us to have that kind of indirect attention, um, and we can kind of, you know, you think about working at your computer, and you stop for a second, look out the window, and you get that kind of, you know, moment where you're like, okay, I can go back to this. It just gives you the ability to restore your attention and your cognition. Um, <clears throat> and then there's stress reduction theory. And that's just that we, you know, we've evolved in nature again. Uh, and this is the setting that we have, we recover from stress best. And, um, and I think, you know, maybe this isn't completely intuitive, but I think most of us get the idea that this, this seems like, uh, you know, it, it makes sense. You know, when you go to a spa, they're not, you know, it's not like a, uh, techno, it's, it's usually like some like nature scenes or nature sounds, but that is what we generally enjoy. Um, but in my work, we really want to look at nature exposure and long-term health outcomes, right? And so we think about these four pathways. So uh, the first one is, you know, nature contact influences, I, I, it's an air quality, but I like to think about this environmental factors, right? Could influence the level of air pollution and the area you live in, could influence your exposure to noise, your exposure to extreme temperatures, and that might have an independent uh, effect on health. Um, green spaces might influence your ability to be physically active, right? You may be a setting for physical activity, and that has strong implications for health. Um, social engagement, we may be more likely to engage with our neighbors. You know, walking your dog in the dog park, you're talking to people, and you're, you're being more socially engaged, and that is uh, strongly linked to health as well. 
And then stress, but I also stress and cognitive function. So there's a lot of research on both stress and cognitive function and how you know even randomized trials of having people walk in green space um, and walk in an urban space and you do even perform better on cognitive tests after you walk in green space, you have lower levels of stress. And over time, you know, that might influence your, your health and well-being. So how do we, you know, actually study this in practice? So I'll take you back to these inertia cell study cohorts. So this is the inertia cell study. We take an address from that cohort. We overlay that satellite data, right? And we can extract the value for the pixel that that participant lives in and say, here's your exposure. Or we could even say, here's an area around your home. Let's say this is a 1,200 um, meter buffer around your home. And we can say, what's the average of all the pixels there in that area? And we make some assumptions, right, that this 1,200 meter area is some relevant neighborhood that you spend time in, and that's why we're going to look at that um, buffer size. Uh, this is just a one study that we did run looking at mortality in the nurse's health study. Um, and we bid people in the quintiles. We adjusted for a number of different factors. And this is a survival analysis, right? A Cox model, um, where basically we saw that people who lived in the top quintile of greenness, even after adjustment for all these different factors, had about 12% lower mortality rate over follow up, right? And so um, that was pretty interesting. We also looked at mediation, right? So in these cohorts, we've measured a lot of potential mediators, those four pathways I talked about. Um, so we looked at you know, physical activity. Does that explain the relationship between greenness exposure? And mortality, they explain about 2%, not very much. Air pollution exposure, which we use this model, uh, PM2.5 model, um, and they explain about 4% of that relationship. Social engagement, which we really, it's really a coarse measure of participation in groups more than once a week. Um, and, but that explains about 19%. So people in greener spaces were more socially engaged and then they had lower mortality rates. Um, so that's interesting. But actually, mental health explained about you know, 30% of um, the association between greenness and mortality. So uh, this mental health pathway can be explored more and published on more, and, and it's pretty consistent that people who live in greener spaces have lower incidence of depression, lower levels of anxiety. Um, so, so uh, and that does translate seemingly into uh, health benefits, right, in terms of mortality. So it's a really interesting work there. Our group and other groups around the, the, the globe have, have looked at lots of other outcomes too, mental health, cognitive function, physical activity and sleep, cancer, birth outcomes, cardiovascular disease. So um, lots of work going on in these areas to expand this work. But I'm actually just trying to set up all the problems here. Okay, so uh, I, I said a lot of things here. There are a lot of assumptions that were baked into all of those things, right? This, that 12 meter buffer, this vegetation index, right? So is greenness around the home the right measure, right? So first of all, what area around the home is right? Is 1,200 meters right? Is 100 meters right? Um, you know, and are we capturing contact with nature or exposure to nature? Are people actually interacting with nature? Um, and then, you know, we look at vegetation, but what is nature, right? Is nature just trees? Um, and also is vegetation the right measure, right? It could be that the, the measure of vegetation is forest, or it could be that it's, you know, agriculture. It could be that it's an overgrown vacant lot, right? Um, so without this specificity, it's uh, you know it's a causal inference problem because I don't know if anyone here studies causal inference. I know a lot of people. In, uh, okay, so so it's a, it's the idea of consistency, right? Where we are not having a consistent intervention that we're proposing because vegetation indices can be increased in many different ways, right? So um, that's relevant for causal inference, but it's also relevant for relevant for policy, right? Because we can't tell uh, you know the mayor. Cambridge or Alston to say, uh, increase the vegetation index by 0.1, right? How do you do that? Um, so we need better information about what specific active ingredients may drive health. And so, you know, in epi research, in spatial epi research, the majority of the studies focus on the home environment. And that's because it's easy to find that data, right? We, with the nurse cell studies, we had that data going back to the 70s because that's how data was collected in mail questionnaires, right? Um, but we know that people spend less than 50% of their time at home, right? So we know we are baking in lots of measurement error into this exposure metric, and that could bias our analysis, right? We also measure health behaviors pretty coarsely in cohort studies. So this is uh, the question on physical activity. During the past year, what was your average time per week 
spin and each of the following recreational activities. And there's more than just these four, but I, this is just an idea. So what do some people think are some problems with measuring physical activity this way? And I'll say, we do this every four years, okay? This is a perfect, this sounds like a perfect measure. Yeah. Uh, it can vary with the year. Great, it can vary with the year. Anything else? Yeah. People probably don't actually know the answers to this. Exactly. So you have to answer when you're sitting down on the paper questionnaire and you have to recall, you know, what you did. Um, and, you know, you're missing variability. You're probably, you know, maybe it's a, the time of year you're doing it. You, you all of a sudden taken up swimming or, or squash or racquetball, right? Um, but you didn't do it at all. Uh, you're going to report, that, you know, it, 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 the most recent information more accurately, right? And then similarly, sleep has the same problems, right? This is how we measure sleep. How many total hours of actual sleep? I don't know why they put the word actual in there. Uh, <laughs> actual sleep do you get in a 24 hour period, right? And then, so I would bet that nobody here sleeps the same amount every single night, right? Um, we also don't know anything about the timing of sleep, right? You could go to bed at 8 p.m., you could go to bed at 3 a.m., right? Um, and you can get the same hours of sleep, but probably not the same quality, right? So, so this is more error. It's kind of baked into all of these studies. Um, so what we try to do to address some of this is we have this new cohort, yet another nursing cell study, the nursing cell study three, it's about 50,000 nurses and nursing students. Now we have male nurses too, not that many, but we have some. Um, and this is a web-based questionnaire. So it started in 2010, uh, recruited online. It's still ongoing. So if you, if you are a nursing student or know a nurse, uh, NHS3.org, you can sign up now. Um, but the cool part here is it's web-based and they fill out questionnaires every six months approximately. And so we can see from you know email responses that we are getting about 90% of our participants opening our emails with mobile operating systems. Okay. So we thought this is you know a really good cohort for mobile health technology to implement some mobile health tech. And so Back in, uh, let's see, this is about 2018, um, we started the mobile health sub study in the Nutrition Health Study 3, which was uh, about 450 participants. It's kind of like a pilot study. Uh, we gave them a Fitbit and we asked them to download a custom smartphone app. Um, and the Fitbit will measure steps, heart rate, and sleep at the minute level, the sub minute level for some of the metrics. Um, and then we also, with the app, Basically, it did administer very short questionnaires, but really what it was is measuring location. So tapping into the phone's location services and getting GPS data pretty much every 10 minutes. Um, and so this for us was great because for our participants, it's pretty low burden, right? They, they had to wear a Fitbit, they got through a Fitbit, um, and they had to download an app, right? So it was not so such a big lift for them. And we've done studies before with actographs and you know GPS devices, they had to charge every night, and it was just a big headache, right? People don't want to have to like carry around a new thing um, and remember to charge it every night too. So, so this was a lot better. Um, so it's much more efficient. Uh, it's mostly passive, right? I mean, you have to wear the device, you have to charge it once a week, um, and it's low cost, right? I and mean, these Fitbits are about you know less than half the cost of a research grade cell so right? Um, and I should mention, sorry, I didn't I didn't mention seven day sampling periods four times across the year. So we didn't say wear it nonstop. We said, you know, you'll get pinged on your phone from the app saying, is this a good week for you? If you say yes, then I'll say, great, wear it, please wear the, the Fitbit for this week. And then at the end of that week, it says, please store the Fitbit or use it if you want to, and we'll check back with you in three months, right? So it was kind of intermittent sampling on these devices. Um, a little bit more about the app. So I'm sure all of you here are thinking about ethics and the, you know, the, the implications of gathering these types of data. We are very attuned to that in our work. In fact, we had to like teach our IRB about even the geocoded addresses and how that's sensitive information, right? Um, so we understand this is identifiable data, right? You know, GPS data on something, you know where they live, you know where they work, you know where they spend time. It is sensitive data, right? And we, uh, you know, I'm sure all of you know, like you download an app, you don't read the user agreements, you just say, okay, I want to use this device, right? Um, they made it better now. You can opt in to location services as was before. Back in the day, it was like default, and you're playing, you know, Candy Crush. You don't know that you're selling your location data to some advertiser, right? Um, so 
we wanted to be very transparent with our participants and also, you know, the way we store our data is as secure as possible. Now uh, we have like a whole risk assessment process for any smartphone app uh, user. So it's it's pretty secure. But this is just to say that like we understand the ethical implications of this data and we want to uh, we want to, to to treat our participants' data as they would want to be treated, right? And and not do we have to never sell the data, but also like even access to this data is restricted within our study team, right? So it's it's um, we very sensitive, right? Um, and so a little bit about the data. So this is the the light purple is the nurses health study three participants overall, and the dark dots are the mobile health sub study participants. You can see that they're pretty representative of where the, the cohort is overall. Um, when you look at the demographics, they're pretty representative of the cohort overall as well. Um, and this is what the data looks like for one participant for one week, right? Purple is heart rate, green is steps, which tracks with the heart rate pretty well. And then this kind of horizontal line is, is latitude, just GPS points, just a proxy for are we getting GPS data on that participant? Um, and you know, pretty easily you can see the variability within a day on uh, a person's physical activity. So we can see when people are physically active, right? We can uh, you know, see if there's gaps in, in, in physical activity. We can see dipping of heart rate tells us about sleep, right? We can pretty easily identify when this participant's sleeping. Um, so you know you can get a lot more information than we ever had before, objective data on physical activity, um, and especially on walking, which is like our predominant physical activity, especially when you get older. Um, most people, you know, people want to know what about weightlifting? What about swimming? You know, you can self-report these things pretty easily. Walking is much harder to self-report, especially when it's walking to the bus stop, walking to you know do errands, or walking even in the office, right? You don't count those steps, right? And people always say, well, my Fitbit missed my steps, or like my Fitbit was, was too good. I'm like, well, how do you know? Have you been counting every step you took that day? Um, there, there, there's, this is a lot of, I think, high quality data, and I can know, maybe we can talk about the, the accuracy of Fitbit data, if you like. Uh, it's pretty good, it, it, it's pretty good for physical activity. Sleep, not as good, but um, what we're getting, as you can see, just a massive quantity of data um, at the participant level. Okay, so now we may only have 450 people in this study, but we have you know 700,000 observations. So it's uh, you know even though it's it's pretty small number of people, it's a pretty big data set. Um, we also have sleep and circadian markers. This is a 24-hour clock. Every colored line is a different day and the heart rate on that day. Um, the shading is the Fitbit identified sleep period. Okay, and this is actually my data when I flew to California, and you can see the, the sleep periods kind of shift to match the local time zone. So we can pick up on variability in, in sleep timing that we couldn't do before. Um, we can also you know, create some metrics of circadian markers, like your most active hours, your least active hours uh, over time. So we can get at you know kind of your your circadian patterns, and then. Um, you know, we can take this data, this is true for physical activity as well, we can compare it to our questionnaire measures, right, and create measurement error correction models, so regression calibration models, and, and uh, basically apply that to the whole cohort. Um, we can also, you know, look at novel metrics like social jet lag. Who here is what the social jet lag? Okay, a couple people. So this is this idea of this kind of mismatch between what society wants you to do and what your kind of internal clock wants you to do, right? So if you have to be at work at 9 a.m., but you're a night owl and you were up really late, well, you know, we may see that people are performing worse when, when they are, um, you know, we can look at the mismatch between their non-work days and their work days. And we can see that, oh, well, that seems like that person is, is, has a misalignment with what society tells them they want to do. Well, other people could be like going to bed at the same time, even on the weekends, waking up at the same time, even on the weekends. So um, some interesting work going on there. And then these are nurses, so we also can look at shift work, right? Um, and see how shift work affects sleep and subsequent nights. Um, so some, some interesting data there too. Um, and you know, I, I've been telling you all about the spatial things. So this is what I really care most about is the spatial data. So this is my data um, commuting from my home in Cambridge over to my office in Fenway, um, and then kind of commuting back. And you can see it's every 10 minutes, so we're not uh, we're not gathering GPS data every minute or every 30 seconds. 
because we don't want to drain the battery on the, on the phone, right? And if we did that, participants would just go be gap, right? So we have to do it about every 10 minutes. You can see there's big gaps, but we have models now to impute the data between those uh, gaps. Um, but, you know, that's pretty much it. This is my data for a whole week, okay? And so you can see that, you know, I'm spending most of my time commuting between home and work. Um, but the really interesting thing here is we can use this data to create personalized exposure metrics, right, that account for mobility. Um, when you think before of the that map I showed you with the point and then the, and then the, the circle and the radius, that little buffer there um, to average the pixels, you know, even that average 1,200 meter buffer is the size of one of these dots. Okay, so we would assign exposure only based on this point right here, and not based on all this other data and all this other locations that I, I spent time in um, that might determine my exposure, right? And so, you know, this is a, a schematic of kind of what we how we look at these data, where we have activity level, right, uh, is the color of the dots. Um, and the location, obviously, of those dots, we overlay that with like these vegetation data sets. So now we can look at, you know, for instance, this person had a bout with moderate or vigorous physical activity, and it occurred in more green space. So we can look at are people more active in greater spaces, right? So a lot, a lot there. But I want to talk to you more about this is a, again a pilot, right? But we're trying to scale this up. So now we're scaling up with. Um, this VW app. This is a platform designed by a biostatistician at Harvard School of Public Health. Um, this is an app-only approach, so there's no wearable, there's no Fitbit anymore. Um, and what this does is this app allows us to collect smartphone-based GPS, accelerometry, and sleep, and also social network data. A little bit about your, your kind of texting patterns and phone patterns. Um, and the nice part here is it's a front-end app, but it's also the back-end storage and processing infrastructure. With AWS, okay. So it also includes algorithms to process all these raw data, um, lots and lots of information. Uh, with this approach, also we're we're starting to tap much more into ecological momentary assessment, so EMA, um, and this is basically repeated. It's just a ping on your smartphone, right? So it'll ask you like, right now I feel happy, right? Or right now I'm, you know, doing this business activity. Or in the past hour I've done X, Y, or Z, right? So you ask these questions that are close in time to the actual behavior um, and or ex exposure, and and then it's you know coupled with the timestamp and the, and the geo tag, so we know where you were uh, either at that point or prior to that point. So we can create these linkages between kind of more momentary exposures and self-reported like things that need to be self-reported like affects, right? We can't measure that objectively. So we have to ask about it, but we can repeatedly ask on that. So we have a few studies with this. First, we have a study in the National Cell 72. These are about 65-year-old participants. They uh, took an eight-day sampling where they answered questions twice a day. So we have the GPS data, we have the, the responses. But then we also have this other study that I'll talk about. This is a, this VW sub-study of National Study 3, and also the Growing Up Today study. This is over a year of passive data collection, right? So we are we're trying to collect a year for each participant, um, and we're about I'd say three quarters of the way through, um, and they answer a question every ten days. So they just you know a little bit lighter on the on the uh, you know annoyance factor, right? They don't have to answer a question you know twice a day. Um, but these participants they're about forty years old, predominantly female, white. Um, but we started this in twenty twenty one. Again, we're kind of it's a rolling admission. So we're almost done. We've already collected about nine terabytes of data. Okay, so most of that's accelerometry data because the raw accelerometry data is really big, but um, a lot, a lot of data on these participants. And so I'll show you a little bit. This is using Tableau. My uh, postdoc, Lee Me, has designed this amazing system so we can kind of monitor ongoing recruitment and uh, adherence in the study. So each row here is an individual participant. And you can see the rolling admission as they come in on the left hand side. Um, and then there's a little bit, you can see these little clips. That's when we shut off people at the end of the month saying, okay, these, these people have all been in for a year. So let's shut off data collection for them. Um, and the color of the, 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 the dots are the quantity of data. So you can see, for instance, there was a little issue with iOS that dropped off here. And so we could see these little gaps and then it, they got fixed. So, um, Things like that uh, we were able to identify and, and address. Also, we identified some other issues that like the app kept pinging people for surveys, and some people would just complete them over and over and over again. It's supposed to be every 10 days. 
but the, the app was malfunctioning for certain participants. We can also see that that was, again, iOS having issues. Um, and you can see down here also data volume. So, you know, 200 gigabytes of GPS data, um, nine, you know, nine terabytes of um, accelerometry data. So we had lots and lots of data to, to sort through. Yeah. What causes variation in daily data volumes? Are you excluding zeros? So yeah, I think we're, 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 if you if you contribute zero, you get you know white, right? You don't get any data. But um, and we we don't really know what the I mean, obviously you can turn your phone off, you can turn off location service, you can turn off lots of things on your phone. Um, we haven't dug that deep into what contributes to that variability in the quantity of data. But we do know, you know, for instance. When we look at the actual data on the back end, we have, um, I would say, established cutoffs. Well, we have ideas for cutoffs in terms of adherence, right? How do we say that the day is a valid day? Um, and so usually we'd say in the accelerometer world, it's like 10 hours a day is a valid day. But it should be a higher criteria for smartphone app because, you know, you, you basically could have them have about 24 hours, right? A lot of these criteria are, are based on awake time. Right here. So, we default that they're always streaming all the data. They should be default streaming all the time. time. Exactly. And for this for this specific study, yeah. And so, you know, we have we're, we'll have to make decisions eventually when we look at this and say, okay, well, how many people gave us, you know, 365 days at least as many days? Um, and you know, we never just say, okay, only the perfect data. We're, we're only going to pick those people. We will we will have many different analyses looking at it different ways. Um, yeah, good question. Another question? So, like, yeah. also those that bought and also sometimes they have to have variables. Yeah, well, exactly. They will, exactly. They they do, but I mean, again, this is Tableau, this is just for visualization. When we get into the actual raw data, that's where we're going to see, like, we need to know more about the number of minutes of valid data for this participant per day. Um, and we're, I don't think it's in these slides, but we have a paper actually that's drafted to look at this and to talk about um, basically. Is this a viable way of collecting data for a cohort? And so far, it seems like yes, it is. We are getting good data. So that's it. Yeah. Um, how do you assess the quality of the data and do you drop any data? So it depends on what you mean by low quality. So so we certainly would drop if like a participant had very little quantity of data, we would say that that's maybe not a valid. Uh, a, you know, participant to use in this analysis, right? But the quality of the data is, I mean, it's it's raw accelerometry data, right? So, you know, there's algorithms to process that data. Um, and there's, I'm sure, a lot of decisions in there where, you know, we're going to throw out like numbers that are way too high. Um, so there is some information that goes in there. With GPS, there's uh, what's called horizontal accuracy on the phone. So the phone will itself say, like, basically looking for a signal. And it'll tell you how how good it thinks it's doing. If the horizontal accuracy is greater than I think we usually use a cut of like 65 meters, we throw it out. So um, so we assess the quality, but I mean beyond that, there's not really much information you have, right? So for for accelerometry and GPS for the survey responses, I don't think there's any. I mean, either you respond or you don't. Um, and you know, it's not like text boxes or anything, it's all multiple choice. So that, that answers the question. Okay, great. Okay, so I have really a, a lot of data, and I, again, I say this to a computer science group, you know, maybe it's a lot of data to you. This is a lot of data to me, right? Just to be able to process this, like we need a year address, right? Like at, uh, at an earlier time, we're like, oh, we'll download the data and, and process it over. And I was like, that was the dumbest thing we ever had, right? So this is just a lot of data. Um, we have now, this is from November, so there's you know 195 days per participant. We have many more days now. Um, we're averaging about 13 hours of accelerometer data and 14, um, it says valid hours. I'm not sure exactly what the cutoff is for validity there. Um, but, you know, a pretty good number of uh, hours of data per person for, for both of those metrics. And then 23,000 questionnaires. See, our response rate is only about 40 to 50% on a given questionnaire. So, um, and that's kind of the beauty of, of this type of sampling, that we don't expect everyone to answer everything, right? They're, you're busy, you're, you're walking around, you're doing, living your life, you might miss a questionnaire, but that's okay, right? We're just gonna see if we can get you know, enough over a year. Um, and the way, I, think, I don't know if I have the slides with me, but I'll talk a little bit about the way our, our um, questionnaires work. 
is that we don't ask the same thing every 10 days. We ask, um, I think about like 12 different things, um, but because we ask it every 10 days, there's gonna be a repeat on some of them, right? So we'll get some questions on, you know, park usage multiple times over the study so we can have repeated measures within a person, right? So that's really nice because we can see then like your you know, within person variability and exposure and how that's related to your responses. Um, and then, you know, the GPS data here is that you, this is again, my data. Um, so it's really rich where you can see so much information about where people spend time, right? Um, we're no longer talking about just like a week of data. It's, it's massive amounts of data. And the question is, what quantity of data do we need? Is this all just like wasting people's time, wasting our time as researchers to get a full year of GPS data? So we can look at these data and apply some metrics and say, you know, it, it, do I get any more information looking at two weeks, a month versus a year, right? And are there seasonal variabilities that, that, that we need to account for? And, and remember, our research questions are primarily looking at chronic disease risk and like long-term things, right? So it, it, I'm not saying that, you know, when we capture a month of data, we capture everywhere you ever go in your life. But do we capture enough to get a proxy for your kind of annual exposure to something, right? And so this will be really helpful because then we know we don't need to capture this GPS data over long, long time periods. And we can also maybe even capture the subset of participants and then do measurement error correction to say, okay, we got some GPS data. We know kind of how this cohort moves around. We can now kind of um, put that onto a, the full cohort. So this is the survey data and it's pretty small. I gotta make the slide better, sorry. But you can see all the different categories. There's pets, fruits, nuts and dairy, green space, sleep. Um, you know, so anyway, lots, lots of different categories. Um, and you can see we actually ask, this is kind of interesting, we ask, at the same time for every participant about each one of these things, okay? So you can see there's some colors that are repeated, I don't know if you can see the lighting, but um, well, we'll get that same kind of uh, time of year for every participant for each one of these questions. So we can kind of compare between participants knowing it was, it was asked the same exact time of year. And so, you know, some, some micro survey responses like quality of sleep, so I mentioned earlier, we don't know about quality of sleep. Well, this we can actually ask you in this day, you know, how is your quality of sleep? Um, and so most of them are getting fairly good sleep, so that's great. Um, we're also validating some of these metrics. So I mentioned the Fitbit, I mentioned research rate accelerometers, um, and, and the Vue app, right? So we're actually asking 50 participants to wear a Fitbit, to wear an Actigraph, this research rate accelerometer, for two weeks. And then uh, uses BB app as well. So then we can compare between all these different metrics. The BB app has a, well, the BB app doesn't have it. The BB app is gathering accelerometry data. And then we have this algorithm that they think can pretty, pretty well estimate sleep duration, right? Based on how I mean, most of us here probably use our phone right before we go to bed and plug it in and put it down, sleep, and then probably pick it up. We use it as an alarm, right? And pick it up, right? So it's not going to be perfect, but it's a pretty good proxy for sleep duration. So we can see how well it functions as a proxy for sleep duration. Um, and yeah, so there's lots of different metrics there. So that's one of our doctoral students is leading that, that validation study. And then uh, I have a grant under review now to um, do cognitive testing on that. Okay, so embedding uh, very short cognitive tests into the app. So it take like three minutes, uh, two minutes, and you know, you, they basically are, are designed so you can't learn, you, know, you can't figure out how to, how to get better at them. Um, and then of course, these cognitive tests would be timestamped and geotagged. So we can see your exposure prior, in the day prior, an hour prior, um, and see whether you know, exposure degrees basis linked to better cognition. So lots to come there. Um, another cool thing about this app is that we didn't develop this smartphone testing app. It's a, a researcher in WashU who's done this, and he's shown that the smartphone app compares very well to gold standard um, cognitive testing, but it also predicts, you know, uh, proteins that are predictors of Alzheimer's or, or measures of Alzheimer's better than some of those, um, those cognitive tests, those, you know, gold standard cognitive tests. So this metric might actually be a really good way of measuring people's cognition in kind of real time, uh, as opposed to like going in the lab and, and, and doing a cognitive test. So some interesting things to come down. So any questions before I move on to the next?
All right. So I'm sure as computer scientists, this is you know, this stuff is is old happy, right? But um when we talk about improving our measure of location data, where our participants go, talked about measuring behaviors better. Um, but what about the specificity of our exposures, right? So what we have been doing in the past couple of years is trying to, you know, capitalize on all this work that's been going on with deep learning, right? And 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 image processing, right? Um, so we know that our satellite-based data, like you know, this top-down approach, tells us very little about the quality of natural and built environments. But geocoded street-level images like Google Street View can provide insight into specific uh, you know, features on from an on-the-ground perspective, right? So as you experience them. And really, these machine learning approaches are just ways of doing this at scale, to scaling up. So I don't have to sit there and annotate every pixel in an image, right? So this just helps us to, to do it faster. And so we can go from our you know, top-down approach to something like this. So this is uh, you know, PSPNet. I don't know how many people here are familiar with this stuff, but um, we're using the uh, 80, 20K training data set for the, for the PSPNet algorithm, which segments every image um, to the pixel level, right? So we can get up to 150 different classes uh, of pixels, right? So this one actually is that this is the wrong data set that I'm showing, but it's a nice visualization. But we get trees, we get grass, we get flowers, we get plants, we get mountains, um, we get sidewalks, we get all sorts of data from, from this. Um, so it's you know now giving us a lot more richness on the specificity uh, of a, a given image. Also, it's measuring what people are looking at as opposed to what a satellite is seeing. And so how do we do this? How do we link this to our cohorts? So what we've done is we've created these grids uh, street network grids going 100 meters along the street network in every MSA, every metropolitan statistical area in the U.S. Um, and then we pull the nearest Google Street View image um, to every one of those grid points. And uh, you can see that we, we've also kind of hacked the algorithms so we can go with the historic Google Street View data. So we get an image every year well, if there is an image available, uh, going back to 2007, which is when Google Street View started. Right? So you can see this is uh, the same location, this is four different orientations. So we get a full 360 um, in 2017 and 2018, right? So um, then we take those images. So we actually have downloaded 350 million Google Street View images. Um, we process those images using that, uh, again, the PSPNet algorithm, the 20K data set. Um, and then we get percentages of each pixel. In, you know, across those four images for that location. So for a given location, for instance, we see it's 23.6% you know, trees within view, right? Or, you know, 22.3% roads within view, right? So we now have that data down to a really fine uh, 100 meter resolution with the specificity in actually what people can see on the ground, right? And so this is Boston, this is not, a, I'll zoom in in a second. Um, this, this is like around the Arboretum where you can see um, you know, some of the trees. Um, but then we've also rasterized all that, right? So now we have 100, 150 different um, things, right, classes, and we've rasterized it so that every raster pixel is 100 meters. And so now instead of saying that's a vegetation index, this actually represents trees within view in Boston, right? And so you can actually see like the the um, ComAv Mall there, right? You can pick up on things where there's more more trees within view. So, uh, you yeah, know, this could be used for sidewalks. This could be used for cars, trucks, you name it. Um, and we have these every year, right? So this is 2007, but we can create time varying metrics of these for every city in the U.S. Um, really quickly, I'll talk about it. one study we did. This is Project Viva, yet another cohort study we have at Harvard Medical School. This is about 2,000 uh, participants who is a birth cohort. So we recruited them when their mothers were pregnant, and we followed them for, for about um, 20 years. And we saw, and this is looking in, um, you know, when they were about 13 years old, we looked at the Google Street View images around their home. We also looked at the vegetation index, and we looked at how that's related to the MIC score, but also waste circumference, measured waste circumference. And then we had them come in and do this DEXA scan. They got, they got like a whole body scan and tells us the distribution of fat in their bodies. But um, we actually didn't see much there. So I won't talk too much about that metric. But the interesting thing we see is nothing really for, for this vegetation index, right? But when we look at grass versus trees, 
we did see that grass, higher levels of grass were associated with lower BMI and smaller waist circumference, right? Um, maybe you could say there's something almost borderline there for XFA, but I don't think so anyway. So we focus on these BMI C square waist circumference. We're not seeing the same thing for trees. Um, and you know, we, we combine like a metric of all these different things, grass, trees, flowers, plants, to make a total green space metric. And we're not seeing much there, but it's really grass um, that pops up. Now this is a cross-sectional analysis. You know, it's it's you know, certainly nothing that's gonna um, you know, I see moving the needle too much, but it is interesting that these metrics are not just telling us the same thing, right? So the vegetation index is not the same as grass from Google Street View. And it does seem like grass is independently associated with this outcome. Um, so, so we're getting information from this, right? We're now, um, as part of an NHLBI funded R1, doing this within the nurse's health study cohorts. So we're taking the Google Street View data. We're also taking Landsat data that's been, um, we've created another uh, machine learning algorithm, had people um, crowdsource and compare images and say, well, you know, is this a, a built up area? Is this a you know, forested area? Basically having having a, 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 this, this Amazon you know, mechanical Turk approach to training um, uh, how to under, understand what a pixel is in Landsat dating, dating back in the 1980s now. So we have that information about every every surface of the US. Um, so we have that also in terms of uh, built natural environment metrics. And then we also have perception data. So we've taken people's, um, you know, again, as Amazon Mechanical Turk, we've had people look at images side by side and say, which one is, looks safer to you? Which one looks more beautiful to you? So these, these perceptions that we can't get objectively, we have to ask people, um, we've trained models there as well. And we've also created models that are specific to people. So you could have a men versus women who might say, you know, a, a certain green space is safe and writing differently, right? So we've trained specific models there. Um, similarly, regions where they grew up, ages, different things like that. So we've created a lot of different models for perceptions as well. And so we're taking all of those exposures, right, and creating these rasters and then linking them to both the GPS data that I spoke about earlier, um, but then also looking at residential addresses and seeing how those exposures are related to health behavior, self-reported health behaviors, um, like physical activity, weight change over time, over decades, and then also cardiovascular disease incidence of stroke and, and heart attacks, right? Um, so more to come there. How am I doing on time? What time are we saying? Um, we have about 10 minutes, uh, including questions. Including questions. All right, so maybe I'll wrap up here. Yeah. Uh, I'll just really quickly say, that all the things I'm talking about are are completely distributed unequally in the U.S. Right. So when we look at you know racial composition of census tract, we see that white people have much greater access to green space than other races. Um, nature could be a tool for health, health equity. So we do see smaller health disparities in places where green space is higher. So I think it's a real priority that we need to think about in terms of understanding green space and health as a way of decreasing health inequity. And then you know. You have to learn the climate crisis nowadays, and every I mean, this is like the most pressing issue um, for our society. Uh, green space is a big player in this, right? So it's a huge carbon sink, um, and it, it provides substantial cooling. I mean, that's another thing to think about: is that locations that are greener can be a lot cooler when it's hot out. And of course, also related to equity, you know, lower income neighborhoods have a lot less green space. They're gonna um, they're gonna have a lot uh, hotter um, um, days compared to wealthier leafy suburbs. So we really need to think about this. Um, I will end, and I'll just end there. And so acknowledgements to all my uh, collaborators uh, and to my funding questions. You know, there's my email address. There's also a QR code here um, if you want to visit our lab's website. Um, but I want to leave some time for questions. So thank you so much. So I guess there's a large part in the middle about sort of like better ways to calculate, like uh, like to get location information and then use that somehow to understand the green spaces and keep track of them. Uh, does using that change our 
like your estimates of like how much room space matters because I think you should the initial one was just like green like the green we use in satellite stuff and then you did talk in the middle about the sort of like graph stuff mm -hmm. I was wondering in the middle the sort of like additional data you know but yes how does that like are there intuitions there about how yeah. green space yeah so one of my doctoral students just defended your dissertation focusing specifically on if I, if I get your question right but what are the differences between GPS based versus residence based? Um, and in general, we see, you know, depending on the exposure, um, there are differences, right? And, and there is, uh, you know, in general, I'd say in, in terms of green space, people are exposed to less green space when you account for their mobility compared to where they live, right? And that's because they might live in a suburb and then commute into city, right? So they're spending time in less green spaces. So we should, you know, think about that and account for that. She's also built in measurement error correction models so that we did actually, you know, calibrate things. And we see stronger findings when we look at self-reported physical activity, for instance, when you account for that measurement error. So um, that is what we're trying, you know, we're trying to do. But now with the Google Street View data, we combine that with the GPS data, that's kind of the next step, right? Is to say, okay, specific measures of exposure that also account for mobility. And how is that related to, to help outcomes, help behaviors first, then it ultimately help outcomes we can look at, right? I I I don't know if you have tried this one already, but there's an app called Strava where people yeah. log their outdoor activity yeah. and they often release um heat maps of the people engaged in these activities. I think maybe it would be interesting for you to like use them and use it as a proxy to like yeah. approach people are to like outdoor spaces where they can use it for yeah. 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 So people have published with Strava data and I published it with Matt Myron data. Um, I mean the beauty of this work is that we can get individual level data and link it to individual level behaviors. Mm -hmm. So the Strava data, you know, and, the, and you get like a big splashy article when you use like millions upon millions of users, but you, you have to kind of anonymize it, right? So you don't get the information on the participant level. Um, so it's, it, it, you know, for me, that doesn't add that much value unless I can get the individual Strava users help information too, right? Um, that would be cool. And and we also talked about like, like Google mobility data, like during COVID, a lot of people were publishing uh, smartphone location data where people are spending time and some somewhat anonymized, right? So it might tell you a lot about where people spend time, but it's not going to tell you a lot about their health of behaviors or health outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that is the limitation. That that linkage is the key. I was wondering, do we know about there being causal relationship between the greenness and the number of these other factors that you're talking about, social yeah. and whatnot? Um, and like yeah, do we know that it's causal? Because like what this talk is you think is like, oh, what should go here and increase? But um, does that necessarily make yeah. sense? So that's the question I think about all, all all the time, right? And so so depends on what you mean, right? So a lot of a lot of research has gone into, for instance, randomized trials, right? So there are randomized trials even at this community level, like in Louisville, there's the Green Heart Project in Philadelphia, they clean up vacant lots. And they have shown that you know, greening places around people's home to does change their behavior, right? Or does change their mood or their, their feelings of hopelessness, things like that. So, you know, in the purest sense, you know, a randomized trial, yeah, it does it does suggest that. You can't do a randomized trial for cardiovascular disease outcomes or anything like that, like longer term, right? So we have to design studies where we are, uh, you know, emulating a, a, a randomized trial. And that's what we try and do when we design these prospective cohort studies to you know, adjust for everything that might be a potential confounder um, and to try and think through kind of what the best design is to answer the question about if I change this, how would it affect this outcome, right? So I'm not sure how well versed you are in like the calls of inference literature, maybe, maybe, or again, right? Okay, so, so I mean, we have lots of other methods like IPW or Pensive Score Man. Like, there's lots of approaches. You tackle it lots of different ways and you try and uh, say, like, this does seem to be causal. There's no perfect study that will say it is, you know, we've established it is causal, um, but that is what we're, we're aiming for with all of our research is to, to have study designs that speak to all the criticisms of like, oh, well, it's just socioeconomic status, right? Like that's the biggest one, is this wealthy people have green space and wealthy people are healthier. But 
I would say the biggest criticism I have for that is that, that how does that explain the fact that when you stratify analyses, and most analyses do this, you stratify by socioeconomic status, lower income people get a much stronger effect in green space than wealthy people. Okay. So, and the reason there's been a lot of theory on this is that basically people in lower income neighborhoods are less mobile, so they're more kind of exposed to their um, neighborhood environment. They have, uh, you know, more comorbidities, so they may be more sensitive to changes in exposure. Uh, and then they also don't have amenities like gyms or uh, private backyards, things like that. So they're not, you know, the, the, the local green space is maybe more effective in, in driving up outcomes. And you do see that consistently over lots of different studies. So to me, that's telling me that if it's confounding by neighborhood SES, I mean, I would I would see like the other way around that wealthy people are getting a bigger benefit, right? I, I don't it's I don't want to get into epi terms too much, but but it's it doesn't seem to me like that's what's going on. And we do our best to account for socioeconomic status as finally as we can, uh, both individual level and area level socioeconomic status. So um can I say all this research is causal? No, I would, you know, that's a, you know, a statement that's really tricky, but it's something we, we really, really work at is to uh, ensure that it's not just some sort of bias that we have to account for that explains it. And I think uh, based on the body of evidence that we're building and building, that it does seem to be there's something causal going on. Um, and I think also these randomized trials, which require a lot of money and long-term follow-up, um, will tell us more eventually. Um, I'm curious about the slide where graphs have a big effect on health metrics, but not green space in general. Yeah. And first, if that was a surprising finding to you, and what it made you rethink about the year in the or just if there is an explanation for that, it's going to happen. Yeah, it was definitely a surprise. But the funny thing is that it, it kind of makes sense when you think about the cohort. So the cohort is adolescents, right? Kids um, who maybe getting physical activity in grassy areas, right? It also, um, you know, the, the the health benefits of green space and different features of green space may affect different people differently, right? So like if you're older or younger, but then also different outcomes, differently, right? So it may be the grass isn't great for mental health, but it's really good for kids physical, like having you know, BMI and, and waist circumference. So maybe these kids who have more access to grass are running around and being more physically active. Now we actually have this activity data, and I don't think we saw that. Right? So I don't think that that's necessarily the answer. We need a lot more work here. And you you said effectively it's a cross sectional study. I think it's really we need to do a lot more work uh, here. But but I think it's an interesting first step to say, look, it's telling us something different. Um, and so we need you know we need to figure out what that is. So I, I think uh, we were surprised. I can make up a, a mechanism for why we saw what we saw. But certainly, we need to do a lot more to understand it. I think that in the case of the parallel part, we might be able to put more. Yeah. Well, completely. I mean, the, the thing is, if you look at the literature across the globe, and most people are using this NDVI vegetation index because it's available globally and it's consistent, you know, across the globe. So that's nice. Um, it does seem like if you use another metric like parks, park access, uh, you don't see strong findings, right? So there is something about vegetation, right? And we don't know what it is. Um, but it, it does seem like overall in the literature that something about vegetation does seem to be beneficial for health, independent of socioeconomic factors and other factors. So we need to figure out what it is, and I think it is complex. Um, but it also seems like you wouldn't lose much by saying plant trees, right? Is there, I don't know if there's a, the only downside I can think of, well, there's two downsides. Maybe one would be allergenicity, right? So you need to think about pollen and you need to think about allergies. So like the only outcome, and it's not consistent either, but but it's asthma and respiratory outcomes sometimes can be worse in some places and other places not, so it's confusing. Um, and then also gentrification. So we need to think a lot about green gentrification, right? So the idea that we should plant trees everywhere sounds good, and the idea that it reduces health disparities sounds good, but me coming in, telling a community, this is what you need, it's good for you, I will tell you how to build this park. And oh, by the way, we'll bulldoze these houses, and we'll plant these trees, 
and then the property values can go up and we'll displace people, right? So we need to think about that as well and work with communities to give them what they need and what they want, right? Um, so anyway, that's the long-winded answer, but yes, it is more complex and that's what we're trying to work at every day. Like to get at the causal question, can we say this is truly causal, but also to get at the specificity, right? What is the actual thing that benefits health here? Um, and it's just, it's really tricky. So uh, I will say that I also, in July, we have a, a Radcliffe exploratory seminar that was funded. So we're going to invite experts on ecology from around the globe who are like, you know, going out there and creating all these measures. And you had somebody here recently, the last lecture. Yeah, Valerie. Should, yeah, so so we had, you know, some people who who worked on just that exposure, well, for, I call it exposure, they would call it measuring, you know, biomass or measuring species types, right? So people can do just that, looking at satellite data, looking at other data, and we want those people in the same room with us so we can create metrics that are really, really like the best um, and link those metrics to our participants because that would be really, really amazing so that we can get at that specimen. The bigger problem is we have cohorts going back to the you know, 70s and 80s, and most people don't have data going back in time. It's like starting now, going forward. And so that's the tricky part. But 